As far as possible, let's kneel before the Lamb, who is also our God and our King. Here we are again, Lord, um, blessed to be here in your presence on this Sabbath day. But as the psalmist reminds us, where can we go from your presence? There's, there's nowhere we can go where you are not. Uh, but we believe in a special way that you've invited us to be here in this place. Uh, most of us here in person, uh, some of us uh, watching from home or from elsewhere. But we're grateful, Lord that you've called us together. Well, you've given us the strength to get through the week. Here we are. Some of us have had a really tough week. Lord, we need your help. We need your strength. We don't know how we're going to do next week. But Jesus, we ask you to give us the strength day by day as you promised you would. Fill us with your spirit. We thank you for the blessings of this week. And Lord, uh, we're grateful uh, that, as was mentioned, we have a kingdom uh, to go to, a mansion that you're preparing for us in your heavenly kingdom. And we look forward to that day. So, Father, uh, we ask you to give us strength. Speak to our hearts through your word this morning. And may we be instruments of your grace and your encouragement to others today. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm moving a little slower today. It's because uh, my knees are really sore. I was helping coach a, a guy's basketball clinic at the school this last week, and that's not my comfort zone. Uh, I would rather be here, I think. I'm more, more comfortable here than I am teaching guys about basketball, but I had a lot of fun, and I learned some stuff along the way, and they were very gracious with me this week. It's good to try things that you're not used to doing. Uh, in a safe way. On February 20, 2014, under the direction of Vladimir Putin, Russian troops moved into the area of Ukraine called Crimea. Do you remember that? That happened? Uh, he claimed Crimea as now part of Russian territory. It took a little over a month to do it, but he got the job done, and now Crimea and everybody who lived in it were a part of Russia. Of course, you remember more recently, just this last year, eight years after the Crimean invasion, Putin uh, sent off his tanks and his troops rumbling into Ukraine again, um, hungering for more territory. And the war still rages on today. Thousands and thousands of troops on both sides have been killed. Thousands of casualties of innocent civilians killed and displaced from their homes. The sort of situation that just makes you angry when you think about it. Uh, an evil dictator, a tyrant, wanting more territory, claiming what's not his, and forcing... Um, suffering on so many people. But I want to ask you something. The people who live in the areas of Ukraine currently occupied and claimed by Russia, are they now Russians? Probably most of them would say, no way, except in Ukrainian or some other language, right? 
They say, no way. We are not Russian. We are still Ukrainian. Even though the Russian flag may fly in our territory, we are Ukrainian, and this is still Ukraine. They're living in an occupied territory with a rival ruler claiming leadership over their domain, over their land. But in their heart of hearts, they're still Ukrainian. They still are faithful and pledge their allegiance to the nation of Ukraine. It made me think about how we as believers in this world are living in occupied territory. We spoke last week about how the kingdom of God is simultaneously already here, but not yet here. And it's already here in the sense that it's a spiritual kingdom that in our hearts, if we accept Jesus as our king, we're part of the kingdom of grace and we'll be a part of that future kingdom of glory. Our world has been under siege and has been claimed to be the territory of a rival ruler of God and his name is Satan. We're living in occupied territory, but we get to decide which kingdom we're a part of. You know, Jesus talked about this. Uh, he admitted Satan has a kingdom. He didn't deny the fact. We'll look at uh, the first verse here from Matthew chapter 12, verse 26. Um, in the context of casting out demons, notice what the Bible says there. If Satan casts out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will his what? Kingdom stand. According to Jesus, Satan has a kingdom. And that should explain to us why Jesus was going about proclaiming the gospel or the good news of the kingdom of heaven. Because there was a rival kingdom that was claiming authority. If, if the good news was evident to everybody, then there would be no need to proclaim it. But because the citizens of the world were living under the regime of Satan himself, Jesus and John the Baptist before him went about saying, there's good news. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. But notice what else the Bible tells us. Matthew chapter 4, verse 8, the final temptation of Jesus. Again, the devil took him up to an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the what? All the, that was a little mushy. Let's try it again. All the what? Yeah, that was much better. All the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to them, all, to, to Jesus, all these things I will give to you if you'll fall down and worship me. So what was Satan claiming there? He's claiming that he's the ruler of the world. Now, if you've ever been on Craigslist looking for housing, sometimes you see deals that are too good to be true. Have you ever seen that? Wow, four bedrooms, three bathrooms for only... $1,200 a month? It's amazing. <laughs> Guaranteed scam. There are people in this world who claim to own a home and they want to sell it to you or rent it to you, but they neither own it nor have any say in the home. Uh, and, and unfortunately, many people are scammed this way. But that's not what Satan was doing, at least not exactly. Because if that's what Satan was doing, Jesus would have said, how can you offer me something that you don't have? He would have said, well, that's not very tempting. Is that the best you can come up with? Probably wouldn't have said it like that. But Jesus didn't dispute this. Instead, he simply rebuked him uh, about tempting the Lord. Jesus admitted, in a sense, that in some way, Satan not only has a kingdom, but that Satan is in some way ruler at present over this world. He's the rival ruler uh, that's been fighting for supremacy for eons. Not only that, uh, look at what Jesus said in John 14, 30. I will no longer talk much with you for what? For who? The ruler of this what? 
world is coming and he has nothing in me. Now, was he referring to God the Father or God the Holy Spirit? No. He was referring to Satan. Jesus recognized, in at least some sense, Satan as the ruler of the world. Very interesting uh, and, and scary to think about, but when you, when you understand it, it makes sense why the world is the way it is. In fact, even the Apostle Paul referred to Satan in 2 Corinthians 4 as the God of this world, lowercase g. We're living in occupied territory with an evil ruler that wants nothing more than to hurt and destroy God, and the way he does that is by hurting and destroying us. So how did this come about? How did this happen that, that we go from God, who's the ruler of everything, to now Satan being the ruler of the kingdoms of the world? Notice what the a parallel passage to the temptation of, of Jesus in the wilderness says, Luke 4, verse 6. And the devil said to him, all this what? Authority. Uh, that's the Greek word exousia, uh, which can mean domain or dominion. All this domain, authority, I will give you and their glory for what? It has been delivered to me, and I give it to whomever I wish. He was saying, I got it from somebody else, and I can give it to whoever I want. So we think in our minds, well, well when did this happen? How did this happen? And of course, most of you are already going there in your mind. It happened in the beginning, um, in the very beginning. But before we go back to the beginning, just a moment, I mentioned that word exousia. Um, it's this power that's been delegated um, to a ruler to have this authority over um, an area of sovereignty. For example, uh, notice the same Greek word is used in this passage in Luke 23, verse 7. And as soon as he knew that he belonged to Herod's jurisdiction, this was Pilate, he sent him to Herod who was in Jerusalem at that time. The word jur jurisdiction is exousia. Uh, now, Herod only ruled over the area of Galilee. But according to Jesus, and according to Satan, his jurisdiction, his area of, of dominion or domain is over the whole world. So how do we understand this? Well, we go back to the beginning. Genesis chapter 1. What was God's plan for the world in the beginning. Genesis 1.26. Then God said, let us make man in what? Our image. We see already from the beginning this plurality within the Godhead. Our image. According to our likeness, let them have what? Dominion. Over where? Over what? I should say, over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over the cattle, and over all the what? The earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God's plan was that Adam and Eve would be the rulers of the world. Uh, this exousia, this dominion, this authority that was extended to them, even though God's still the, the rightful owner and ruler of it all, but he was going to let them rule it, as long as they stayed faithful to his plan. But then what happened in Genesis chapter 3? Yeah. There was this test, this temptation. Adam and Eve both gave in to the temptation, each in their own way. And in that moment, although Scripture doesn't spell it out for us explicitly, implicitly it's there. Not only did they fall into sin and death and disease and sorrow and suffering, when they ate of that fruit and gave into that temptation, they also essentially gave over the keys to the kingdom of the world to Satan. He now, through tr trickery and deceit and, and temptation, he had taken away the keys of the kingdom. Um, he'd taken over the title to the world, and now he claimed it for his own. And due to the rules of, the, of, the, of engagement, in this battle, God, even though he's still and always sovereign, 
God allowed Satan to work out his own plan. This wasn't the first time that Satan had tried to do this sort of thing. Earth was not his primary objective. We'll get to that in just a moment. But I want you to hear the words from one of the founders of our church, Ellen White, in a book called God's Amazing Grace. Notice how she describes this transaction. Among the lower creatures, Adam had stood as what? As king. But when he transgressed, this what? dominion was forfeited. Not only man, but earth by sin had come under the power of whom? The wicked one. At his creation, Adam was placed in dominion over the earth, but by yielding to temptation, he was brought under the power of Satan. When man became Satan's captive, the dominion which he held passed to his conqueror. Just like we were talking about. Thus Satan became the, quote, God of this world. He usurped the dominion over the earth, which had been originally given to Adam. So the world, which was under God's control, and God was delegating authority to Adam and Eve, because of their fall into sin, the dominion, the power, the authority went to the conqueror, Um, sadly. Uh, But we can see the effects of this everywhere in our world, can't we? Um, In fact, Satan is called the prince of the power of the air. Same Greek word for dominion. I think it's Ephesians 2.2. When natural disasters happen, people say, God, why did you do this? Well, God's not the one claiming this immediate dominion over the air. Right now, it's Satan. Uh, Satan is the one causing these awful tragedies. This fall, we're going to talk about why is there suffering. Uh, We're going to get more into the nitty-gritty of this topic of of why does God allow the evil in the world since he's sovereign, since he's still ultimately in charge. Uh, We'll flesh that out more later, but for the moment, we realize and we see this isn't God who did this. It's Satan who's done this. Uh, The universe, and we are seeing just how Satan governs. And he governs by suffering and destruction. Uh, But knowing that he claims the authority in this world helps explain uh, passages like Job 1, verse 6 and 7. Uh, The Bible says there that there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. This is a heavenly council happening in heaven. And Satan also came among them. And the Lord said to Satan, from where have you come from? So Satan answered to the Lord, from going to and fro on the earth and from walking back and forth on it. Essentially, what he's saying is, I was just walking around in the back 40. I was on my property, just walking around, doing what I do. He was claiming dominion over this earth. So where do we go next? Where do we go next? Um, Like I mentioned earlier, this wasn't the first time he'd claimed and tried to usurp authority. Many of you are familiar with these passages, passages like Isaiah 14, uh, which talks about this being called Lucifer, originally perfect in all his ways, but through his own doing, corrupted himself and became the Satan that we know today. Uh, But there in heaven, what did he say? You have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my what? Throne. This is kingdom language. I got a position, I got a throne, I'm going to raise my throne up as high as I can make it go. Above the stars of God, I will also sit where? On the mount of the congregation. If you're sitting on the mount, he's saying, I want to be at the very top, the pinnacle of the kingdom of God. I want to be God. On the farthest sides of the north, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. He wasn't saying... I love the character of God. I want to be like God, loving in all ways, perfect in wisdom. That's not what he was saying. He was saying, God has more power than me. God has more authority than me, and I want it, and I'm going to take it. Thank God he failed. Amen? 
Revelation 12 describes war breaking out in heaven, and Satan and his angels were cast out. Sadly, because of the choices of our ancestors, we, we bought into the lie, and earth was plunged into this fight also. But I don't want to just share negative news with you this morning. Amen? There's good news. And as we think about this kingdom language, these rival rulers, Jesus gave us some very clear hints that there's good news. Check out what he said there in John 16, verse 11. And he says, and concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is what? Judged. The ruler of the world. He's referring to Satan. He says, he's judged, which means that there's a sentence and a punishment coming. Amen? There's a detention that's on its way. It's called the millennium for Satan. And then eventually it's called the lake of fire for his punishment. John 12, verse 31 Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of the world will what? Be cast out. There were actually two casting outs of Satan. Once at the very beginning, uh, but he still had partial access to heaven. We saw an example of that in the book of Job. He still could go in some way to heaven. Uh, But if you study Revelation 12 carefully, I believe you'll see that his final casting out occurred at the cross when he no longer had any access to the heavenly city. And eventually, um, but because of the cross, his doom was sealed, and eventually his sentence will be carried out. Sadly for us, though, we've been born into this world. We didn't choose to be born on this world of sin. I didn't, did you? We didn't choose it. I'm thankful to be alive. But now that we're alive and can make choices for ourselves. we get to choose which kingdom we live under. We get to choose. Colossians 1 verse 13. He has delivered us from the power of what? Darkness. And conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love. Because of what God has done for us, and that word for power of darkness is the same word, exousia, the domain of darkness, some some Bibles even translate it. We get to choose if we want to change our passport from saying kingdom of darkness to being shredded and getting a new passport, which says kingdom of God. Part of the kingdom of grace now and the kingdom of glory in the future. Uh, And when does this happen ultimately? When do we get to see the kingdom of glory? Last week we talked about it. At the second coming, we get to experience the kingdom of glory. Look look at what Daniel foresaw in his vision. Daniel 7, verse 14. Then to him was given what? Dominion and glory and a kingdom. This is ultimately in reference to what Jesus shall receive. Um, He's received the title for it already, in a sense, because of his victory at the cross. But when he returns to the world, the deal is made full and complete. He's receiving dominion and glory and a kingdom. Then all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion lasts for how long? Everlasting, which shall not pass away. And his kingdom is one which shall not be destroyed. If that strikes you as good news this morning, just say amen. This is exceedingly good news. Though things are dark in this world now, uh, with spots of brightness, there is a brighter day ahead. And we can, we can punch our ticket for that day in our hearts right now by letting Jesus sit on the throne of our hearts and minds. Notice how Daniel describes it also. This is our last passage, a verse for the day. Daniel 7. The court shall be seated. Uh, this is in reference specifically to the little horn power, but ultimately behind the little horn is Satan himself. They shall take away his what? Dominion. To consume and destroy it for how long? Forever. Eternal consequences. And the kingdom, then the kingdom and the the dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to who? To the people, the saints of the Most High, 
His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominion shall serve and obey him. You know, in Revelation chapter 20, it says during the millennium, we get to sit on a certain type of seat. What does it say we get to sit on? Thrones. Uh, we get to be uh, royalty and priests. In other words, the, the kingdom was never about God saying, I'm the boss, listen to me, uh, and only do what I say. Now, we should do what God says and listen to him because he alone knows best. It was, but it was never about consolidating power and keeping it to himself. God was trying to distribute the blessings and the authority. And so in the kingdom made new, it says the dominion shall be given to the people. We all as equals in the kingdom of God will get to live and reign in that perfect place forever. I'm looking forward to that day. How about you? I want to be a part of that day. Uh, and I close out with a simple sentence here from the book Thoughts from the Mount of Blessings. And I chose this background picture intentionally. It says, there are two kingdoms in this world, the kingdom of Christ and the kingdom of Satan. To one of these kingdoms, each of us belongs. There's no third kingdom opportunity. There's a guy that, that has the, uh, the sovereign nation of Slojamia, uh, out in the desert. He's claimed a, a, an acre as his country. Uh, I think it's in Nevada. Uh, he has no structures or buildings there. He's just claiming sovereignty there, hoping to be recognized someday by the United Nations. Um, <laughs> I doubt that will ever happen. There's no third option. Either we're part of the kingdom of God, kingdom of grace now in our hearts and lives, living out the will of our king as we wait for the kingdom of glory. Or we're a part of the kingdom of darkness. And each of us have had an opportunity to see how the darkness of this world runs. And I don't want to be a part of that. This morning as we close, I just want to say in my heart, Jesus, I want you as my king. And I want you to help Show me if there are ways that, consciously or unconsciously, I, I may be walking in the ways of the, the darkness of this world so that I can step back into the light. I want to be a part of the kingdom of grace and glory, and I want to live accordingly. Is that your desire this morning? Why don't you pray with me? Loving Heavenly Father, we are grateful that you love us so much. You've, uh, you've already saved us uh, through the work of Jesus on the cross. Because of that, we, we are forgiven. We're being forgiven. We are forgiven. Um, and someday, Lord, we'll be rescued not only uh, from the things that we've done, uh, but we'll be rescued from this world and all the darkness contained in it. We want to live as citizens of your kingdom this day. We want to remember who is our king, who our rightful leader is. And Jesus, we want to represent you to our families and our friends and to the world this week. So empower us, embolden us, and give us the protection and peace and the Holy Spirit that we need to make all this possible. And this is our prayer. Let all God's uh, children in his kingdom say, Amen and amen.